scripture is James chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet. Have you not made then distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to you to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme and honor the honorable name by which you are called? If you really fulfill the, law, the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery but do not murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. This is the word of the Lord. Well, amen. <clears throat> that is the text for these, this week's message. So let me pray first to open this talk. Thank you, Father, for this day, for your word, which is faithful, Lord, and sufficient for life and godliness, Lord, for faith and practice. I pray, Lord, that your word, that the central issue here be expressed well, Lord, that what you need the people of God to hear will be properly expressed and that our hearts will be open to receive. I ask you to bless all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So last week, uh, <clears throat> we finished chapter 1, verses 19 through 27. I'm sorry, that was two weeks ago. I was being corrected and by my wife, of all people. So... Uh, we Two weeks ago, we were in James chapter 1, verses 19 through 27, and I kind of made a point that in the text of Scripture, we tend to divide sections of Scripture by headings and chapters and verses, and the book of James is a book that tends to move with pace because it is somewhat, it, it, it has several literary uh, forms that can be ascribed to it, but one in particular, and it's the one I favor, is that it's more like a sermon. And because it's like a sermon, it has a flow and a movement that goes from thought to thought, and which is not new to didactic or narrative. But the point is, we can lose that flow with chapter verse and especially chapter headings that are superimposed on the text. So I'm going to do what I did last week. This is, let me see, right to left. Y'all are reading right to left. This is last, uh, two weeks ago, this is hearing and doing the word, and then this is the sin of partiality. I'm just taking the text right as it comes out of the ESV. And so if you were to separate those two as if they were two separate subjects or not related, you would miss some of the emphasis that is trying to be expressed by the Holy Spirit. The, the really neat thing about the fact that... Uh, the book of James reads like a sermon, is when you think about it, if that is the book of, a book of canon and the Holy Spirit has inspired that book, then who's really preaching a sermon to us? I mean, isn't that something? I think that today I'm going to turn on R.C. Spur no, I'm going to turn on the Holy Spirit. I would like to hear him preach a sermon to me. I thought that was a pretty neat thought. And so as we move forward, understand that the, the Holy Spirit is moving us through the text and graduating us from thought to thought and building on a case and making application in our lives. <clears throat> so the title of today's sermon is Playing Favorites. 
For many children, the first day of school can be a very scary day. It's off into the unknown from the safety of home, mom and dad, warmth and familiarity to a cold classroom full of strangers. I know it terrified me when I was uh, just a wee little one. In fact, in kindergarten, I was kicking and screaming and my mother had to come back and hug me. And I was terrified. It is here where we take our first steps in socialization skills. We learn to compare ourselves one to another and quickly find our place in the social strata. Amen? That's how it works in school while you're growing up. We learn to evaluate based on what we look like, how we talk, how intelligent we are or are not. Are we, are we pretty? Are we handsome? Are we ugly, quick, or slow? Athletic, coordinated, tall, short, thin, wide. This is where we, where, and I know that on several levels, we're all uh, identifying with this. Do we have money or are we the poor kids in class who can't afford the nicer clothes? Because I know nowadays they do uniforms in school, but when we were kids, you had to go buy your new school clothes. And that's probably a common thing now. And, uh, you know, if you didn't have a lot of money, your, your new school clothes was one set, and that was that. But if you had money, you know, and so that stuff shows up when you get to school. And after a while, you start looking around going, oh, wow, I'm not like that. Unfortunately, it is by these standards that we learn to assign value or worth to ourselves and others. This process continues into adulthood and to one degree or another will determine how we will deal with our fellow man. Loving and being loved becomes a lifelong negotiation of safe spaces carefully constructed behind walls we have built to keep our hearts and kingdoms safe. Starting with our relationship with God, only Christ can break down the walls that divide and bring us back into fellowship with himself and with one another. And you know, that negotiation that I speak of, this uh, that we have in relationships is truly a part, you know, that, that when we teach about marriage and family, in particular with marriage, we teach that a marriage commitment is 100% and 100%. It's not 50-50. That's a bad negotiation, you see. But we truly do negotiate. You know, why men and women marry are for different reasons. And they come to the table and they have to negotiate. That's, that's how Jordan Peterson looks at relationships. And I'm not saying he's totally out to lunch. I'm just saying this is kind of how we operate as human beings because we have safe spaces. That's, that's the popular term today. We have places that we know that, we, that nobody can get to. It's private. It's my place. And if I have to, I'll do what I can to keep it safe. And so we build walls. And truly, what we really want is to be known and to be loved. But that's a dangerous place to be. That's very threatening, and transparency is very difficult, and this is what we lost in the fall. We lost that transparency, and we started right away after that first bite, brick by brick, building walls. They, they put fig leaves. They hid from God. They made walls. And so part of the freedom we find in Christ is that he has broken down that wall of separation. <clears throat> It says in verse 1, my brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. I, that's the ESV. I'm quoting three texts there this morning on this one verse because we all have the ESV. Most of us probably don't have the NIV, which is where I learned it. My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. And the one that I'm really keying on this morning is the King James. My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. And I like the way that has they, they, they word that there in the King James. It says, don't have the faith of Christ. You know, the good faith of Christ that set you free, the Lord of glory. Don't have it respecting people. Don't have it for that guy and not that guy. Don't treat this person differently with the grace that you get in Christ, the Lord of glory, with this person, and then when you turn to face this person, it's different. We really need to be understanding that when we, when we have a room full of people, that 
we're all at the same level. We're not allowed to pick and choose who to respect or disrespect. That is not the nature of our Lord and his gift of free grace and salvation. <clears throat> at the cross, we all come to Christ on our knees. It's kind of like death, you know. Nobody takes anything when they leave. Well, it's the same at the cross. When Christ regenerates us, repentance starts at the very bottom for anybody. It doesn't matter who you are, your status. It doesn't matter if you're thin or wide or tall or short, have a great voice. None of that matters. It doesn't matter if you had a great job, have a big house. None of that matters when you come to Christ. You better, if you're not down on your knees, I'm wondering if you came to Christ. If you're not coming in humility, I'm wondering about what kind of Christ you're serving. And, you know, the thing is, after regeneration in Christ, what happens is we become illuminated to the fact that we have walls and illuminated to the facts that, hey, you know, we're all the same in Christ. And so now we, we become part of the team that works to destroy those walls because they're walls we've built. And now Christ is calling us to be part of the team, his team, to break down our own walls, to be vulnerable. So that we can, you know, it's just as hard to receive love with a wall as it is to give love. And we need to learn to give love more than any, because it is more blessed to receive, and love is a selfless act. We all put our pants on one leg at a time, so to speak, right? No one is above anyone else. The cross is the great equalizer. You know, I... Um, Years ago, I went to a youth group, and I saw it was, it was disappointing. And I know that the youth leader didn't mean to do this, but, um, you know, we've all been through our phases in life where we're the kid that didn't fit in, we're the kid that got hurt. And then it was very convenient to be part of the crew where you fit in, and part of that negotiation was you might have to be a little bit of a bully or you, you realize other people aren't going to feel good. But if you, if you kind of side over there, all of a sudden you'll be, you know, pushed out of this group. And so it's just much better business to sidle up to something that helps you stay safe, so to speak. And I remember being in the youth group watching some of the kids that were, that were not the cool kids. They were not the kids with talent. And they just didn't get the same attention. And it really bothered me. And I think when we look at this text, that that has to be part of how we're thinking. In fact, I think it's at the core of how we're thinking. When, when the cool guy walks in the room, or the rich person walks in the room, or the mover or the shaker, how do we react to that? Acts 10, 34, so Peter opened his mouth and said, truly I understand that God shows no partiality. Now in that particular text, he's speaking about uh, salvation has gone to the Gentiles as well as the Jews. There's no ethnic or tribal or race or class or social status. The gospel has freely been shared to all who can hear it and receive it. Colossians 3, 11 and 12. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free. But Christ is all and in all. Put on then as God chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. And you know, uh, there's been a lot of fluff in the news about race, and I don't mean to demean the seriousness of the issue, the seriousness of the issue but the problems that we're speaking about today have really are, are, can be right in the same room with everybody who looks the same. This is this is not so much a racial problem as it is, or a tribal problem, as it is a human problem. We're humans, and we tend to classify. That's what we do. We make distinctions, and, we and you know, a lot of that is for good reason, and it's necessary, but we never take that opportunity at someone else's expense. We do it so that we have knowledge and wisdom. Of course, I see some, in fact, I would be a fool not to recognize when a poor person enters the room which is harder to recognize in our culture. Because if a poor person enters the room and I'm kind of uh, nonchalant about it, then how can I actually enter into his world and help him? When I see a rich man enter the room, how can I help him by not ingratiating him in his riches? 
You see, because the kingdom of God is difficult for the rich, just as it is for the poor. They just have different angles they come at that they have to strive against. It says in verses uh, 2 and 3, For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man is shabby, in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears fine clothes and say, you sit here in a good place while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down on my feet, there are two temptations afoot. Uh, and I'd say uh, I've seen them both, I've been a part of both, and I, uh, I'd like to be self-righteous and champion the fact that I don't do that, but probably not true, well, no, definitely not true in my life. The one temptation is to show favoritism to the wealthy and the powerful person, because after all, this could be of an advantage to you. Um, sometimes churches are places for business. People come to church because it's a, it, you'll meet people, you can give out your business card, da 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 da. And so when you see a mover and a shaker come in, oh wow, I gotta get his number. And I wanna make sure he's treated right. And, and, and you just behave differently if you're not careful. You might show that favoritism out of respect for his wealth, you might do it out of fear that, hey, if I don't treat him right, maybe he, you know, after all, that guy's an important guy, he tithes a lot to our church. Can't lose that guy. Do we really think that way, or do we, are we secure in knowing that Jesus Christ has all the money in the world, and what we really need to worry about is offending him? I mean, do we really live that way? I think we need to focus on, hey, God has all the money. Now, the, the rubber meets the road in COVID when it seems like uh, stability is gone, Possible income is gone. What are you trusting in? That's the issue. What are we trusting in? Are we trusting with our ability to smooge the rich guy, to impress the rich guy? Or are we just going to live our normal life like this is just another brother in Christ? In fact, he, has, he may have more need of discipleship than the poor man because he's ingratiated himself with all kinds of false notions about how he got rich and whatnot. Are we seeking to gain money or position or higher status? The other temptation is to show disdain. Now, I'm classifying the poor and the rich because James goes after this particular subject. And if we remember the last text we finished from, what was the last subject that James addressed? True religion. And what is true religion? To minister to the widows and the orphans. Are they the rich people? No. No. They're the people, remember we talked about glory ministries? They're the people that don't, you don't get a lot of recognition out of helping them. The tithes are not going to be coming in on boatloads if you help out the orphans and the widows. Now, I'm not trying to be snarky when I say that. I'm just saying this is how people really think. If they didn't, the Holy Spirit wouldn't address it. And so those ministries that don't get a lot of fanfare... Uh, do we not favor them because there's, there's less advantage to it? So it's no mystery that James leaves with that subject and the very next thing is he comes into this sin of partiality because that's what James is talking about. Don't be partial against the poor or against the guy who doesn't seem like he can get a lot done for you. And go to this guy. This is what the Pharisees did. They, they loved the attention and they knew that they had all the power. They were the power brokers. And they expected it. But we graciously get to love one another regardless of station, regardless of position. <clears throat> it says in verse 4, Have you not then made distinctions among yourselves, I like this, and become judges with evil thoughts? You know, when we think of evil thoughts, we think greed, lust, murder, adultery, corruption. Have we ever thought of partiality and favoritism as evil? I just remember from when I was a child and I felt, you know, uh, biased against. You know, there were times in my life where I was an all-star athlete and there were times in my life where I was the, the nerd playing in the band. Now, in some schools, you're really cool when you play in the band, but in our particular school, it wasn't cool. And I literally went from being captain of the football team 
to a drummer in the marching band. And I remember one of the guys on the football team yelling at me from off the field, calling me names and laughing at me. And I didn't really care, but I just, that's how it works in life. That's how people are, because we're sinners. That's how sinners operate. Now, I'm not talking about when we're just joking around or whatever. But those are evil thoughts. And what makes them evil is we're not attributing to that creature the image of God. That's what makes it an evil thought. I mean, in fact, I'm, I'm looking over here at Mr. Price, and I'm like, hey, that's the, the guy in the military. He's got a really cool picture at home with him in a boat. He was on the anti-pirate squad. And I'm like, now that is cool. But that's just something to be appreciated. That's not something to lift him up. You know, I, I keep mentioning the cool subject because I've been in churches where the whole motif of the pulpit and the whole motif of the atmosphere is the cool guy. Hey, you know, and the cool vibe in the church, and we're bad, and we're radical, we're radical for Christ, we're cool people, man. Jesus is all about it. Have you ever heard that, felt that vibe? Get on the Jesus train, man. You want to be in? And I've, I've, I've felt the weight of that in the room for the guy who's not the cool guy. And I'm like, this is, this is not feeling like like what the gospel is supposed to be about. And so we, we need to know that we can appreciate everybody in the, in, the, in the room, not just the standouts. There's that quiet guy who needs our attention. There's that quiet person who needs, who needs fellowship. There's that quiet person who, even though he's being quiet inside, there's a lot to say. There's a lot going on. And we need to be sensitive to that and loving and caring and kind. We need to be patient, loving, and kind. It says in Leviticus, uh, it says we become judges with evil thoughts. Now, this is a, is a throwback to Leviticus 19, 15 to 18. You shall do no injustice in court. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great. But in righteousness, you shall judge your neighbor. You shall not go around as a slanderer among your people, and you shall not stand up against the life of your brother, of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but what will you do? Instead of doing all that, what will you do? You shall love your neighbor yourself for I am the Lord now I got to tell you I feel pretty safe in this congregation I think one of the things I love about this congregation is I don't sense a lot of that sort of thing and I've sensed in the past that people come here because they do feel we have a small community that loves one another and knows how to treat each other well but to continue with the thoughts that the Holy Spirit gives us in James, we too are all subject to sin and partiality. And if we're not careful, we won't lay our lives down for one another. Do we, here's a big one in culture. Do we treat someone different because they're good looking and pretty and handsome versus someone who's not so much? And, and I'm just going to tell you, the answer is yes. They've done studies on this. If you're a uh, a good-looking fella or a pretty lady, you get better job advancement. And, and I'm not here to correct social uh, mores and whatnot, because that's not the answer. What I'm saying is the answer lies in Christ dealing with our hearts so that when we meet people, we don't look at that. What we look at is Christ inside. We don't become evil judges that make distinctions and we just as soon because that's the easy thing to do, because after all, I mean, come on, that guy, that girl, they're nice, but we need to move on to the good-looking people, to the people who've got it going. It says in 1 Peter 1, 17 to 19, and if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that 
of a lamb without blemish or spot. You know, I'm reminded of a particular uh, text in Scripture where Peter is in with the Galatian church and Paul is there and there's a dispute between the Judaizers and the gospel of freedom. And so when Peter's with Paul and the Gentiles, he acts one way. And when he's with the Judaizers, he acts another way. Now, why would he do that? Paul, to his face, says this is hypocrisy. Why would he do that? Well, because there's advantage. He's, he's a little sheepish. He's fear of men. These, these Judaizers, they'll condemn him and tell him how bad he is if he doesn't submit to those certain rules of the law. And so Peter kind of sheepishly joins up, and even Barnabas did it with him. And the point of that story for me in this context is even an apostle can compromise his convictions, sidle up to the wrong issue, and walk all over his own convictions to the point where the apostle Paul has to say, hey, not in this house. And, you know, by the way, that is the most loving thing Paul could do at that moment. Sometimes the most loving thing we can do is pull someone aside, and I don't think he pulled them aside. I think he said it to Peter right in front of everybody. But I think the most loving thing we can do sometimes is pull people aside and say, hey, we need to love one another, man. What are you doing? I just saw this is your conviction, but all of a sudden it's not. It says in verse 5, well, before I move past that point, I just want to bring out what the text is doing as well, not just its application in our circumstance. At the time, in that world, if you had money, it was kind of a sign that God was blessing you and he was on your side. You know, it's like being a New York Yankees fan. You think God is on your side, but it's not true. <laughs> He's on the Red Sox side now. <laughs> you know, and so they really did see it that way. Uh, because of the Old Testament, because God's promise of blessing on his people. And so if you're righteous, you're going to be blessed. And if you're not righteous, that's why the psalmist says, why do the wicked prosper? He's a little confused by that. Because this text can make you feel like, oh, I see. So this means that poor people are more righteous than rich people. And God blesses and favors poor people and not rich people. Well, that's really not what the text is trying to get at at all. Because rich people come to Christ as well as poor people. I'm trying to not make this about class distinction, but what the text is addressing as a cultural issue is you think righteousness is part of your riches and that in their poverty, they have less righteousness. And so it's, it's, a, it's a motif. It's kind of like uh, when, the, when the Bible says uh, that God confounds the wisdom of the wise with the foolishness of preaching. Now, does that mean that it's dumb to be intelligent? That's kind of an oxymoron, isn't it? Is it, kind of, is, it, is it bad to go to school and be educated and have lots of knowledge? Of course not. But it's really bad to be puffed up in your knowledge. And so that's the kind of the motif here is don't think that your riches mean that you have God's blessing. For God blesses the poor. And this is a revolutionary thought for the Jews. Kind of like God blesses Gentiles and Scythian, and barbarians, and Greeks, and poor people. Now, I don't think anybody's rocked in this room because, I'm honest, we're in the United States of America, and there's not a whole lot of people we know in this room. But they're out there. The point is not, we just need to find poor people and start a revolution. The point is, in our poverty is where Christ meets us. It says, listen, my beloved brothers, in verse 5, has not God chosen those who are poor in this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? Now, right at the outset of verse 5, we have an echo back to last two weeks ago. He says, listen, hey, listen up. So in our first beginning text, we're talking about the sin of partiality. But now as we move into verses 5 through 7, we move into God's sovereignty. So that's who we are. That's what we do. That's how we behave, even sometimes in spite of the cross. But what is the central issue? The central issue is God is sovereign. It says, listen, my beloved brothers, has not God 
chosen those who are poor in the world. So there's two things about that. God is at work and that there are poor people in the world. Now, why isn't everybody rich? Why doesn't everybody have money? Is, does God just not love them? Is God just mean? Or does God have a purpose? And I say that in light of what we see in our community, in our culture at large. We think the struggle is a class struggle. And we think the object of our faith is we just need to fix the poverty. The war on poverty from the 60s, remember that? That successful war that we've been fighting for 50 years and losing? Do you really think that's what the gospel is aiming at? We need to just trumpet the cause of the poor. Or is God making a point about poverty here? I wrote in my, my notes a word I just kind of made up. God has chosen to demonstrate the gospel in poorness. In much the same way he has confounded the wise in the foolishness of preaching. It says in Jeremiah 9 and 23, Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. And let not the rich man boast in his riches. See, our boast tells us what we think we're proud of. Nobody's proud of being poor. Well, some people are. Asceticism was a movement of poverty. But for the most part, people are not proud of that. And yet that's the place where God touches and reaches us the most because that's where we come closest to the ground and realize I'm nothing special. The man who makes money and boasts in his riches, he thinks he's special. The man who's mighty, he thinks he's special. The Pharisees in Luke 16, 14, the Pharisees who were lovers of money heard all these things and they ridiculed him. See, they think, oh, that's silly. There's, obviously, this man is, has lost it. My riches clearly display that God is for me and God is saying no. In fact, he's saying you're poor and blind and naked in the book of Revelations. He says, you poor people, you think you have it all, but you're poor and blind and naked because they did not have a fervent love for God. They had lost their first love. Matthew 5 and 3 says, <clears throat> Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Amen. And I make a point about the poorness here once again to reiterate, this is not a political movement. This is not a socio-economic movement. James is not coming to us to say, well, then we need to start a charity and a fund. Now, I'm not saying he doesn't, because clearly he's telling us to remember the poor and remember the widows and the orphans. But what he is saying is, don't trust in your might and your riches and your wealth. I think uh, we in the United States are a little too um, comfortable in our riches and our wealth. And, like, you don't have to have a lot of money in the United States, and you're, you're doing pretty good. I mean, it's an absolute awful thing that we had a flat tire. It's like, did you see the scratch on my car? I mean, I just think about the level of life that we live in the United States, and it's, it's kind of like rich people used to live back in the 40s. It, it's just become so ubiquitous. And so what's the point? Well, the point is we can get very comfortable thinking everything is okay because everything is okay. But maybe not. Billy Graham once said, if God doesn't judge America, he's going to owe Sodom and Gomorrah an apology. Now, <laughs> it doesn't feel that way to us. I can't wait to get in my car, go eat at a nice restaurant, go home, take a nap, and then go get some things done. Just kind of coasting. And so we have to be reminded that we, as human beings, are poor and need the riches of Christ. And so James has done it in chapter 1, and he's doing it now. He's demonstrating to us that God's definition of rich and poor is not our definition. Those are two different matters. No, it really is that way. I don't care how much money you have in the bank. That's not how you define riches. That is not... God's definition of rich. That just means he gave you a little more than he gave the other guy, and now he's going to see what you do with it. You're accountable for that. But that does not mean you're righteous. It just means you have a different test. You know, I said once to my wife back in, I think it was around 2000, 
Something about one of those winning the lotto questions, you know. And I said, uh, well, honey, if God wanted everybody to be rich, you know what? We'd all be rich. But you know what? Most, and I mean most by a large percentage of the world, is not rich. Now, if God is sovereign and most of the people aren't rich, how do you suppose that is? Could be that the Lord has designed it that way. He has designed struggle. He has designed that we work through things and don't just have it handed to us. I can tell you one thing about COVID. For a while there, I think it can make you lazy. When you don't have to go to work because you can't or because there's no economy to support you, and then you actually have to go to work again. I mean, I'm thinking about the unemployment. It's, you know, my daughter's been unemployed for the last two months, and she's getting those nice unemployment checks. You know what the tragedy is? Now she has to go get a job when it runs out. <laughs> That's just how bad we are as human beings. It, it, you get comfortable and lazy. Now, if that laziness is there in your heart, was it there before you got laid off? Of course it was. It's just getting laid off exposed it. You know, and it's like winning the lotto. The winning the lotto won't change your character. It'll expose it. So these issues of poor and rich have nothing to do with the solution is giving the poor money or taking all the money from the rich people. I think Karl Marx had it wrong. Karl Marx wanted to make utopia on earth by making everybody the same, which is a myth. It's not possible. But that does not solve the problem, and that is not Christ's cure to this problem. If anybody has seen that in the text this morning, come talk to me afterwards. we got some things to talk about. So, verse 6, but you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? And this is where we throw in. You have thrown in with worldly concepts, and in doing so, you bully the poor. In much the same way, knowledge puffs up as a worldly means to gain the upper hand and lift oneself up at the expense of others. So I think of this like, so they're saying, look, when you... When you sidle up to this sort of thing, what you're really doing is becoming part of the problem and not part of the cure. You know, these are the people, and, uh, and once again, these are stereotypes, but what he's saying is, by and large, the people with the money are the people that make it difficult on the people with no money. And you think that sidling up to them and kind of cozying up and getting familiar is going to make a difference with that, and it's not. Philippians 2.3 says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. So don't do anything with, with selfish ambition. You know, there's another scripture that says, uh, Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, work with your hands, and mind your own business. It's one of my favorite scriptures. There's, there's no ladder climbing on that one. There's no rubbing up to the next guy. There's no getting in with the important people so that you can get that better situation. Because when you're doing that, look, and I'm not against um, getting a better job. Jobs and networking and relationships, that's one thing. But, Paul, but, but James is talking about here in the context of the people of God and how we generally treat people. We, we, if we're not careful, that makes us dismissive of anybody who can't help us. That's the problem with these uh, 12 wide and 10 deep systems. You know, uh, these, uh, what do they call them? Like the, not like a pyramid, but uh, those, those businesses at home where your job is just to recruit as many people as you can. Well, when that becomes your life, Believe me, you're not going to be hanging around with too many poor people. They're not very important to you. They're not going to help you. After all, you're going to become like the people you hang around with. Isn't that the world's wisdom? But the Bible says we should seek fellowship with these people that we may come down and, and, and descend and be on par with to love properly. And you'll see this when you go to a third world country. My wife's from Honduras, and I lived there for two years. And you see it a lot more than you see it. You see these inequities. They're, I mean, I used to keep large sums of coins in my car to constantly just be given to the street people. Because you just needed to, because there was so much of it. And these people really do need 
not like a lot of people here in the States. Verse 7, are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? And so in this last section of this point, it says, are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? In other words, how do they blaspheme the name? How do they blaspheme God's name? By how they treat other people. And you are getting cozy. It's like Peter got cozy with the Judaizers who did what? Blaspheme the law, I mean the gospel, by their doctrine, by their lifestyle. I mean, this makes me think about greedy politicians and um, prosperity preaching Ponzi schemes. <laughs> you know? We, we want to get the good stuff. We want to we favor the people that are going to help us along. But these are the people who blaspheme God's name by being sneaky, conniving. Calvin says, to dishonor the poor is to dishonor those whom God honors, and so to invert the order of God. That's how that blaspheming is occurring. Blaspheming is like taking the third commandment where it says, don't use the Lord's name in vain. Well, when you use the Lord's name and then behave in a way that ruins the Lord's name, that's blasphemy. And it's a serious thing. Blasphemy is a serious thing. That's a serious word we use. So in the last section here, I've titled uh, verses 8 through 13, the golden rule. Because that really is the cure. If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. The solution to factions and social inequities and the like is the royal law, love your neighbor as yourself. It's not through class warfare, where you try to enrich the poor and stick it to the man, and you don't impoverish the rich. Once again, Karl Marx had it wrong. That is not the cure Jesus Christ gave us. It's not political conquest. It's Christ building his kingdom in our hearts, one heart at a time. His kingdom is not of this world. John 18, 36 says, Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting, that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. I'm speaking once again to the moment that we find ourselves in when you turn on the news. The, the answer to man's poverty, the answer to man's uh, class inequities are two things. The solution is not to go to war, and the solution is not political. And that doesn't mean there's never a time for political solutions in war. I'm telling you this issue, Jesus says the poor will always be with you. You are not going to win the war on poverty. This is a one person at a time issue. God gives us everybody with not a lot of money. Not everybody wins the lotto. And you're never going to change that. There's, look, at pyramid schemes are called that for a reason. There's only enough room at the top for a few. And it's never going to be any different. That's not me speaking, um, I'm not trying to discourage anybody who's trying to make it to the top. I'm just telling you, there's only so much room at the top, and God has not called us to war and political upheaval because of that structure. That's called a hierarchical structure, and God is the author of hierarchical structure. And so God always tells us in the, in the scriptures, receive it, accept it, be the best you are in the position he's put you in, and love one another in the process. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. For he who said do not commit adultery also said do not commit murder. If you do not commit adultery but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So James's point here is, don't think that because you haven't murdered anybody, robbed a bank, or committed adultery, that this sin of partiality is not so bad. It makes you a transgressor of the law. It makes you eligible for separation from God just as much as murder, just as much as adultery. And we need to pay attention to that. So, and this is again an echo back to the last 
text that we went through in James. It says, so speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. It says in James 1.22, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Verse 25, but the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. So do you really want to make a difference? Do we really want to make a difference in this world and be that example that Christ has called us to be, starting right here in our own local congregation? Live as one who is set free from judgment unto condemnation. Live under the law of grace that sets us free to love our neighbors and ultimately demonstrate the love of God. For judgment is without mercy to the one who's shown no mercy, but mercy triumphs over judgment. I think as we, as we look at this text, uh, you know, it's, it's my heart's desire in all of this to always be part of the solution. When we're in a social group, we, we always treat people with the love of Christ indiscriminately, not making distinctions, not making quarrels, and loving one another according to the royal law of liberty. There's the other law. If you want to live in that manner, it, you're going to be a transgressor just like a, a murderer or an adulterer because all that starts in the heart. Murder starts with hatred. Adultery starts with lust. And what you do to the poor or to the the not-so-qualified guy, it starts in your heart. And that's the point James is making. It starts right here. And the only cure to that is to love one another and live. Okay, so you want the law of liberty in your life? Do unto others as you do unto you. Undo, uh, do, unto, do, to your, do unto others as you do to yourself. Okay. Well, that was pretty slick. So uh, I, I, I can only exhort us today. Uh, as we move forward through this text into what uh, James has coming next week, which is faith and works. Well, I'm sorry, two weeks from now. Uh, let us meditate on these things and see how we can be servants to our community, servants to our brothers and sisters, love one another in the love of Christ. Let us pray. Thank you, Father, for this word. Thank you for sharing with us through your Holy Spirit. I pray that somehow something is attached to our heart today that we needed to hear that would uh, supply us with all that we need to do to demonstrate the love of God to others. In Jesus' name, amen.